be very happy to answer your questions. So the presentation today will, first of all, I will introduce some of the things that I'm really interested in with research. And then I will talk about research such as value relevance, disclosure research, blockchain, and then I'm going to talk about some very important topics from the International Accounting Standards Board. Then I will talk about a very useful tool, which is the research pitch. And finally, I will give you some tips, which are tips that I've come up with after being an editor for many years. I hope you enjoy the presentation. So I work at University of Western Australia, and many of you probably have not been to West Australia or maybe not Australia, but this is my business school that you can see here, this picture. And as you can see, it's a very modern business school. It's about 10 years old. And in the business school, we teach the standard disciplines such as accounting, finance, economics, management, and marketing. Now, my office and my building overlooks this beautiful, beautiful bay. This is called Matilda Bay. So in Australia, I look out to this beautiful water every day. Now, of course, with COVID-19, I haven't been working at work for about five weeks. But when I go back to work next week, that's where I'll be working from. So a little bit about me. So as I said, I'm a professor of accounting at University, University of Western Australia. I have been there now three years. I'm also the head of department of accounting and finance. So prior to that, I was at University of Queensland, Monash University, the Australian National University and the University of Melbourne. Now, some of those institutions you may ha have heard of before. So during my 24 years or whatever it's been now of academic career, I have mainly taught in financial accounting, but I've also taught in information systems. And this has helped me a lot recently, obviously, uh, with, the with the move to online teaching, but also it has influenced my research. So a lot of my research right now is going down the technology path, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, for the last uh, three, four years, I was a member of the International Accounting Education Standards Board. Now, this standards board is part of IFAC, and I'm sure you've heard of IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants. So um, I was on the consultative advisory group for a few years, and in that role, we did make some substantial changes to international education standards, including IES2 and IES4. And these accounting education standards are important to mention because they focus on information communication technology and also a very important trait of professional scepticism, and some of you might have heard of professional scepticism. For the last nine years, I have been on the AFANS board. Now, AFANS is Accounting and Finance Association Australia and New Zealand, 
And now I find myself as the president of that association and I will be president for two years. Now, it's particularly challenging at the moment being president of an association which largely involves our annual conference. But the very exciting thing for me is that I am organising now the virtual online conference. Now, I'll talk more about that later on because it is a free conference. Uh, you just need to be a member, which is a minimal cost. And if any of you are interested in attending our virtual conference in July, it would be lovely to see you there and I would welcome you as special guests. In addition, my service experience includes being deputy editor of the Accounting and Finance Journal, also associate editor of the Accounting Research Journal. I'm currently an editorial advisory board member for the Australian Accounting Review as well. I do a lot of PhD supervision and I'm currently supervising students in lots of different areas, including um, data analytics, so information communications technology, but I'm also supervising in the area of unrealised gains and losses, management earnings forecasts. So they are some of the areas which I'm currently supervising. My research is very broad. It has been broad for many, many years. Um, I have conducted research in the area of XBRL, which some of you might have heard about. Um, as I said, I'm currently doing some work in data analytics and robotics, um, internet-based internet financial reporting, but my research, which I did my doctorate in, was in the area of disclosure research, value relevance, and I'm going to talk a lot about that today because I believe it is a very important area of research and it links very nicely to what the International Accounting Standards Board program is at the moment in terms of... Research areas. Okay. So I thought we'd start off looking at some important accounting research areas, and these are areas which I've had a number of papers published in. So I thought I would take you through, first of all, value relevance, and then we can look at some disclosure research. So value relevance research. Now, if you have a look at any international financial accounting journals, you will see many papers that have been published in this area. Now, for value relevance, there are many different models that you can use, but um, basically at the end of the day, what we're looking for is a model where there is an association with share price or with share returns. So these are the models that I've been using with my value relevance research. So we basically say that with our accounting disclosed information in the financial reports, something is seen as being value relevant if there is a predicted association with equity share market values. So it's a very important question, this value relevance, because we need to have a look to see whether or not an accounting amount is relevant to a financial statement user and whether that can make a difference to that user's 
decision making. So for that reason, because we're talking about difference to decision making, we then know that value relevance research is going to be very interesting to a number of different stakeholders. So that's why I think it's still very, very good to do research in this area because value relevance research does tap into many topics suggested by the International Accounting Standards Board and by the Financial Accounting Standards Board. In addition, it's very relevant for regulators such as the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Federal Reserve Board. In addition, also useful for management in firms, auditors of firms, financial statement users, etc. So you can see that what I'm basically saying here is value relevance research has a very broad appeal. So the main model that if you have a look at publications in accounting journals, international accounting journals, in the area of value relevance, the main model, the main model that you will see that is being used is what we call the Olson model. Now, there are various versions of the Olson model that have been used over time. I tend to use the modified, simplified Olson 1995 model. So basically, how this model looks is that you have firm value, um, and we often express this in the form of share price which is a function of book value of equity and the present value of expected future abnormal earnings. Now, as I said, this is quite a simple model and in a minute I will show you the actual algebra for this and you'll see that it is a very simple model which we often call parsimonious in nature. So it's a parsimonious simplistic model but seems to work quite well. So as I said, value relevance research is when we're looking at a predictive association between our equity market values, which is generally our share price, and accounting amounts from the financial statements. So these models that we'll have a look at in a minute, they form the basis for the tests in the value relevance literature. And as I said, we focus really on that dependent variable, which is firm value. As I said at the start, we can also look at various other ways of expressing this relationship. So we can actually focus just on market capitalization, or we can look at share returns. So equally, these alternative specifications are very commonly used in accounting research. So let's move on to the model. And as you can see, it is a very simple parsimonious model. And on the left-hand side, we've got the dependent variable is share price. And then we've got our main variables of interest, which are the book value of equity. So this would be per share and the earnings per share, which is the E. Now, why this is a really nice model to use in research looking at different, any different variables that you're interested in seeing a relationship with share price 
is that you can easily add these models in, sorry, you can easily add these variables in to that model. And you're going to see some examples of that in the next paper, couple of papers that I focus on. So the first paper I wanted to present to you tonight was a paper that we had published last year in the International Journal of Accounting. Actually, it was accepted last year. I think it was published this year. So the title of this paper is Do Risk Disclosures Relating to the Use of Financial Instruments Matter? Evidence from the Australian Metals and Mining Sector. So this paper I wrote with my honours student from um, University of Queensland. So what we're doing in this paper is investigating the value relevance of risk disclosures relating to the use of financial instruments in the Australian metals and mining sector. Now, the metals and mining sector in Australia, for those of you who know a little bit about Australia and basically what makes up a lot of the GDP and so on in Australia, is our extractive industry. It's an incredibly important industry in Australia and also the actual companies in this area make up the majority of the market capitalisation on our stock exchange. So it's always important for us to investigate this particular industry, this particular sector. In fact, because we have large resources, particularly here in WA, Western Australia, where I'm living at the moment, um, Australia has been very much part of the development of the international accounting standards on extractive industries. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight into the motivation for this paper. So as I said, we're looking at financial instruments and I'll talk a bit more about why financial instruments soon. And we're looking at the largest sector in Australia, which obviously is very important for Australia. So what we do that's quite special in this paper is we use a manually constructed disclosure index. So this is where it took a long time for us to collect the data because we had to read every single annual report for the companies we looked at. We had to look at the notes to the financial statements and we had to collect that individually for our sample. So basically using our manually constructed index, we what we do is we are going to use that index in our value relevance Olson model. So just before I mentioned that one of the cool things about this model is that you are able to insert any variable that you think is useful and could bring about a change in share price. So that's what we're doing here. We're inserting a disclosure score from our manually constructed index and we're going to see if that disclosure score is value relevant. Now, I mentioned before that the other part of this is we're focusing on the disclosure of financial instruments. Now, as you know, this is a very important part 
a very important decision and an important strategy for any company to think about is what is their strategy with financial instruments. So financial instruments are used to manage a firm's risk. So when used in hedging, the financial instruments can lower cash flow volatility. However, as we know, financial instruments can also be used for speculation. And when it's used in this way, it can actually have the opposite effect. It can increase a firm's level of riskiness. So this is why it's quite important to investigate the hedging strategy of a firm because it's important to know exactly why they might be using financial instruments. Now, to answer that question, what you need to do is you need to look very closely at the notes to the financial reports. And you need to look closely to see if you can identify exactly why the firm is using financial instruments. So with any of these type of disclosure or value relevant study, a very important thing about it is that you need background information on the accounting regulation. So if you want to get published in the international accounting journals, not only do you need to have an area of interest which is quite topical and important, you also need to have some regulation behind the study. It definitely helps. So in this case, we're looking at the Australian Accounting Standards Board Accounting Standard AASB 7, which is known as Financial Instruments Disclosures, and that was released in 2005. So that accounting standard is now 15 years old, but what's important about this accounting standard is that it has been considerably revised. It has been changed over the last 15 years. So when accounting standards need to be revised, and this is another area that quite excites me in my research, is when there is report that an accounting standard needs to be amended because it's not working quite effectively or quite efficiently as it should be working, or companies are having problems with its implementation and they need further information about how to implement the accounting standard. Now, a really interesting example of this, which is currently happening with the International Accounting Standards Board, is the accounting standard on insurance contracts. So you may be familiar with this accounting standard, IFRA 17 insurance contracts, but there has been a delay with its widespread implementation and there have had to be changes made to that accounting standard before it is effectively implemented by firms. So as I said before, this type of situation I find very exciting because it does provide an opportunity for us researchers to try and investigate, understand exactly what is going on with that accounting standard and why there are issues with that accounting standard.
And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the work program of the IASB towards the end of my presentation. Okay, so I mentioned that we're looking here at AASB 7. AASB 7 is also known as IFRA 7. So in Australia, we basically adopted international accounting standards uh, 15 or so years ago. And all of our accounting standards are pretty much equivalents of the international accounting standards. It's just that we still issue our own accounting standards using our AASB. So this is probably very hard to read and I apologise for that, but I'm just going to very quickly cover this. This is just the timeline to show you all of these developments of the accounting standards that I'm talking about in relation to extractive industry. So, oh, sorry, in relation to financial instruments. So 2005 was the original accounting standard. That was effective from 2007. Then we had, as I said, often there needs to be revisions and there were revisions in 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. So all of those revisions have been made and that's why we're focusing on this timing of the sample for this paper. Now, there have been significant, there's been more amendments that have been made post-2011 uh, and, again, that, that's just an example of another potentially exciting area that you might like to have a look at. Okay. So I mentioned before, again, and this is something you have to ask yourself with any research paper, is you've always got to have answers to the what, why, implications, et cetera, type questions. So first of all, the focus was on financial instruments, and I mentioned how important it is to look at financial instruments in terms of risk. Secondly, we know that we have a financial instruments accounting standard. We have the regulation, and I said that's really important as well. Thirdly, we have an ex a sector here, the metals and mining sector, which is very important as well. So what I'm saying here is there are a number of different important motivations for this research. So one of them is financial instruments themselves. Another one is the industry sector. Another one is the regulation. So there's three things which we're really looking at with this study. So this sector, extractive industry, uh, metals and mining, there are many, many risks in this area. So it's a risky industry. There are great high, high returns. So that's fantastic for some companies. There's a lot of very wealthy people who have invested in this area. There's some very rich companies. And you would have heard, obviously, about companies like Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton. So these type of companies belong to this sector. As I said at the start, it's the largest industry sector in Australia. There's 650 companies, and a lot of these companies operate outside Australia in over 100 different countries. 
So another interesting point is that there are dissimilarities between financial and non-financial firms. And obviously for our financial firms, there are different methods which they might use to measure market risk. So I think it's always important to control for the financial and the non-financial firms. And quite often in our research, we do do subsample analyses or we create a dummy variable to obviously try and understand the differences between these types of firms. Okay. So getting to a very important part of this study, and this is probably where the novel, the unique part of this paper is, is in our disclosure score. So I said at the start, this was quite a time consuming part of the research because we had to manually calculate this score for every single firm. We have got two types of scores that we use. We use a raw score and we use a weighted score as well. So um, the raw score, as you can see here, we, to avoid the problem where some firms do not need to disclose certain financial instrument information, their denominator of the score obviously will be different. So every firm will have its own maximum score and its own total score. So as I mentioned at the start, we use the simplified modified Olson model and our main variable that we're testing is the disclosure score. We also introduce a number of control variables. Now, with the Olson model, if you have a look at the research, you will see that Often, we only use a test variable in it. We don't always use control variables. Um, so you will see some papers do, some papers, papers don't. But the typical research is really just with the one independent variable disclosure score that you can see here. But I have noticed that there are more and more papers now that are probably adding in some controls. The main issue with controls is looking at the degrees of freedom that you have, obviously. So looking at your sample that you have, your sample size. So here is the disclosure index. And this is what we were looking at with our financial instrument disclosures. So we looked at both qualitative and quantitative information. So you can see we're breaking it down into the different risks. So we've got credit risk, we've got liquidity risk, and you can see the information in the right-hand side, if you can read that, that is all from the accounting standard. So all of, this all of this information here is telling us what the accounting standard requires. So as you can see, there's many different things like the company's objective policy for managing risk, the amount that best represents its maximum exposure to credit risk, information about the credit quality of the financial assets, 
an analysis of the age of financial assets, how liquidity risk arises, a maturity analysis, and so on. So all of these aspects we had to look for in the notes. So it continues on, and you can see we're also looking at market risk, Um, currency risk, interest rate risk, the market risk, and other price risk as well. So all of those different scores give us a maximum, a maximum disclosure score. And that's what we were trying to identify with our sample of firms. So this table is showing you the descriptives for the disclosure index. So our maximum number of firms we had in our sample was 91. Now that probably doesn't seem like many firms to you. For those of you who do research on US companies, Asian market and so on, um, but in Australia, it's quite um, common to have low samples like this and it's quite acceptable um, in terms of getting published as well because this is basically the number of firms that we have um, that we can get the full data for. So you can see that what we've done is we've taken our disclosure index and we've put it as a percentage, expressed it as a percentage. So you can see the mean percentages for each of the different types of risk. So for credit risk, liquidity risk, market risk, um, foreign currency, interest rate, other price, um, et cetera. So you can see the means there, um, so quite a bit of variation um, in terms of, remember, maximum would be 100%. And um, we have many firms with zeros as minimums. And the overall disclosure score mean is about 74%. Um, qualitative is lower than our qualitative. Uh, sorry, qualitative is lower than a, our quantitative scores. So we do separate regressions for both of those. So getting to our regressions and um, for value relevance research, it's very common that you actually identify your share price 90 days after the annual report release date. Um, so if you have a look at other value relevant studies, you'll see the share price 90 days is very commonly used. And basically that's to allow for the information to get properly disseminated amongst different users. Uh, we also show in sensitivity robustness testing, we show zero. So price at day one or day zero as well. So usually we don't find any differences with that robustness test. So these are the results at 90 days after. So that's our share price is our dependent variable and our book value and our earnings per share. So this model is basically a model where left-hand side, as I said, share price, and then right-hand side, we've got our book value and our earnings per share. So if you actually have a look at the companies in the sample, you will see that more or less, the total of the book value and the earnings add up to basically pretty much very close to what the share price is. And that's just really how it turns out. Uh, it's never gonna totally equal, obviously, but that just gives you a bit of an understanding about how it looks when you're looking at your data. And it's very helpful to know that when you're actually looking at checking your data. 
So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this research in terms of the statistics, the actual statistics that we focus on and the adjusted R squared. So the adjusted R squared, the explanatory power of the model, it's pretty typically around about 40 to 60 percent is the average adjusted R squared. So um, I tend to get a bit nervous when they're very high. So I always look again at the data when they are quite high um, and also quite low. Um, that's also something which you can often flag there might be a problem there. But this is pretty much spot on. Of course, it varies a lot with sample size, but just when you're comparing results with other studies, and that's another very important thing to do in publishing in international journals is when you are discussing your results to very clearly make sure you compare your results to other similar research in the area. So here is our disclosure score. We find this positively and highly significantly associated with share price. So basically companies with higher scores. Okay, so the basically if your disclosure score is increasing, you would expect to see a resulting increase in share price. Um, also, we add in couple of control variables and the ones we have our leverage. So for highly geared firms, we hypothesized a negative association with share price, um, which you would expect often accounting in uh, often investors, users of accounting information will see a highly geared firm as being quite risky. And often that results in a decrease in share price and audit um, as well. Although we didn't know what would happen with audit. We weren't sure whether it would be positive or negative. So, but as you can see, there is no significant result here for our two control variables. So, um, as you can see in each of these um, scenarios, we have got um, positive, significant um, disclosure score. So we then, as a robustness, use a equally weighted disclosure score. So the equally weighted um, is where instead of actually adding up all of those different areas like market risk, interest rate risk, et cetera, as the amounts that are in the index, we just weight them all evenly. So they're all worth like a third type thing. And so we do that. And we also, as you can see, we look at the, we break it down um, as well. So you can see that our disclosure score is still statistically significant uh, when we look at liquidity risk and when we look at our market risk. So we've still got significant results there. And then we've got some robustness tests in terms of a different model. So as I said, a very important thing to do with any Olsen type model value relevant study is to show a returns model. And so we show a returns model as well with the change in net income and the disclosure score. And we also include dummy variables um, for life cycle, so for um, different type firms. So we've got some that are early in their life cycle, so they're more exploration firms, and some that are more advanced, more mature, so they are production firms. 
We also look at profitability subsamples, so profitable firms and loss-making firms, and we also look at the level of risk. So as you can see here, our disclosure score, again, is highly significant in terms of explaining changes in share price with our exploration firms, with our production firms, both profit and loss firms when we separate them into subsamples and firms with large beta, so our um, high degree of risk but not small beta. Okay, so they're the results for that paper. And at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you a list of references. So I'm very happy, obviously, for you to um, have a look at the full paper. It's now published, but if you can't get a copy um, you can email me and I can provide you with a copy of that paper as well. Okay. So I just want to come to a second paper now, which also is value relevance, because now we've already seen the use of the Olsen model. I just wanted to show you another example of its use in another paper, which we're currently finishing off this week, actually. So this is a second round um, for the Australian Accounting Review. And this one is on a very different area because it's on private equity firms. So um, that's a totally different area for me to look at. But again, it's using the Olsen model and it's also looking at something called segment reporting. So getting back to what we were talking about, about getting published, again, you have to have a look at what the new, unique bits of the paper are that you are focusing on in the research. So this paper is contributing a couple of things. It's looking at segment reporting, which is a very, very interesting accounting disclosure. And again, like financial instruments, there has been a lot of accounting standard change, a lot of regulation change in that area. So I will talk a little bit about that because that's really important. And today there are many opportunities in this area. It's also looking at private equity. And private equity for target acquisitions is, is, again, it's an area where there hasn't been much research. So we're making two contributions in this paper. We're contributing to segment reporting literature, and we're also contributing to the private equity literature as well. So this paper is a little bit different with the sample because we're using a matched sample of both target and non-target listed companies. And as I said, we're, we're using segment data. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the private equity research area, basically these investors are targeting underperforming and under-resourced companies. So because segment data gives you background on business segments, we think this will be really useful for our private equity investors because they get additional information to use for decision-making purposes. The private equity sector has grown quite a bit in Australia, so it's become topical. Um, it's one of those areas of research which is growing. Every year you'll see more papers that are published, but there's still 
not a lot published in this space. So contributions. So with any research, you need to make contributions, and I've been talking quite a bit about these contributions tonight or today, tonight for me. Um, so we're contributing to the value relevance literature uh, with the private equity area. We are also contributing to segment reporting, which I mentioned before. And segment reporting has been researched quite a bit, but a lot of people have found um, some issues with certain disclosures in the past. So we're providing some more information here or some more evidence, if you like, that segment reporting is value relevant. Okay. I'll, I'll go through this um, pretty quickly because what I'm going to do, as I said before, is I'm going to leave you with these paper references. And even though this one is about to go back to the journal, I can send you a working paper. So private equity, uh, it's important to notice that there has been rapid growth, as I mentioned, um, in this area, and obviously also widespread globalisation. Um, in terms of our initial public offerings, our private equity investors have been involved in over one third of those. So that's a fairly significant statistic. And private equity is what we call a collective investment scheme that invests in companies with the intention of obtaining a controlling interest, restructuring or adding value to an investment. So the the target companies are typically held more short term, um, so it's typically held privately and restruct restructured over a period of three to seven years. Now, a little bit about segment reporting, and I don't mind spending a little bit of time on this because segment reporting opens up many doors in terms of research opportunities. So a lot of people regard segment reporting as one of the most important areas in terms of note disclosures in a company's annual report. It does give information on a company's operations and prospects, which is very useful for many stakeholders, including investors and analysts. There's been quite a bit of research done on this in the past. Uh, it's something, as I said, that I, I think I said I did my PhD in this area. So um, it definitely occupied a lot of my early research. But a lot of those research were more on the, on why people disclose segment information and why, what determines more high quality segment information and also issues of value relevance as well. So the accounting standard is an international accounting standard. It's called IFRS 8, and that became effective in 2009. There has been, like financial instruments accounting standard, there has been many versions of international segment reporting standards. So it has had quite a um, varied past, if you like. But the accounting standard that was effective in 2009 basically follows the US, the US financial accounting standards accounting standard. So that one was known as SFAS131. So the reason why the International Accounting Standards Board went down this path was because they needed to show or needed companies to show that there was more information 
in the annual report relating to the segment. So they wanted an increase in segment information. And they wanted that information to be more useful to investors and analysts. Now, back in the US, when they adopted SFAS131, they found that there was some really, really good benefits. And those benefits were in terms of the number of segments that companies were disclosing, uh, an increase in information and better consistency. So just before I leave the really, really good stuff about IFRS 8 segment reporting, there's also been some concerns. So it's not all happy smooth sailing with segment reporting. So um, there has been um, some firms who are concerned about an issue which is called proprietary costs, where you introduce, um, you actually disclose too much information to the market, which could potentially erode your market share. So that's one of the issues. Some firms have found it costly, expensive, because it is additional information. So just so we know what it looks like, Qantas Airlines, I'm sure you've heard of the main airline in Australia, which is called Qantas. So Qantas has got six segments. So they have got Qantas Domestic Airways, Qantas International Airways, Jetstar, which is the budget group of Qantas, Qantas Freight, which is the transportation, Qantas Loyalty, which is our frequent flyer, and it's called the Qantas Club, all of that type thing, and also Qantas Corporate. So just showing you what the segment disclosure looks like, and I don't know if you can see that properly, but what segment reporting does is it breaks it down into these individual segment revenue, segment earnings before interest and tax, discretionary accruals, and earnings before interest and tax. So this is the information that we think is useful to investors. But remember I said there's a bit of a problem because it's probably useful to competitors as well. There's also information about liabilities as well, segment liabilities, segment assets and so on. So getting back to my question about target firms. So what we want to see here is we want to see if target companies looking at, uh, sorry, private equity looking at target firms, if this information is useful for their decision on that target company. So our two hypotheses, so first of all, we're looking to see if the information is value relevant for the target acquisition firms and if there's differences in the value relevance between target firms and matched firms. So remember, I showed you that model before, the Olson model. So we have got our basic model here, which is the one I introduced to you last paper. And now we add in these additional variables. And these are called segment variables. So we've got segment variable for book value of equity, segment variable for earnings per share. Now, we actually include two segments. We include the highest segment for earnings and the second highest segment for earnings. And then we show the book value of equity 
based on those earnings segments. So if I just went back to my Qantas example, so we would be showing here the segment for Qantas Domestic and the segment of Jetstar because they're the two, they're the two highest segments for Qantas. So we would take earnings for that, earnings for that, and book value of equity. So that's how this model works. So if you can see the results there, um, we have a sample of 73 firms and for our model with our individual segment variables, we are getting significant results for book value of equity, which is probably the largest, um, largest earnings segment, obviously. Nothing for book value of equity two. And then we're getting, um, interestingly enough, we're getting highly significant for earnings per share two and not very significant for, uh, barely significant for earnings per share one. We also include a number of segments because we thought that if there are more segments disclosed, that might influence results, but that had no, no bearing. Again, we use two different types of share price. Like the previous study, we use share price 90 days and share price at time zero. So the final table here is showing you the difference between target and matched firms. And the main takeaway here is that our results are more significant in terms of the individual variables for the target firms. So for the target firms, we've got a statistically significant association with book value of equity with book value of equity two as well, whereas we have very weak for book value of equity one and nothing for BVE two. We've got weak for EPS one and nothing for EPS two, but interestingly enough, the earnings um, segments are more valuable for the matched firms. Uh, we've also got statistically significant results for our other earnings. So basically, if you think about Qantas, there were other segments. So we basically just add all these together and call them the remaining earnings and the same with the remaining book value of equity. Okay, so to summarise that, what we were doing was looking at a match sample of targeted and non-targeted firms and looking to see whether that segment data is value relevant to private equity bidders. So we overall find mixed findings um, in terms of the value relevance. We do find that there are certain variables which are relevant in terms of segment variables in explaining changes in share price. So the conclusion of this is that there is further research needed to look at different countries, different jurisdictions, to see if the different regulations impact on private equity bid activity. Okay. So I'm conscious that I've now been going, I think, for about an hour and 10 minutes or so. So I have got a full suite of slides here. Um, so I won't go through them all, but I want to spend some time just looking at some tips that I can give you on research. So I'm just going to skip ahead here. Um, and I will leave these slides for you to look at. Um, but let's let's finish off the presentation by looking at some research opportunities going forward. 
So I mentioned at the start that I get a lot of my ideas and my ideas for my research students, my high degree students, from the International Accounting Standards Board or from the Financial Accounting Standards Board in the US or from the Australian Accounting Standards Board in Australia. So I always go to the relevant respective website and have a look at their work plan. So if you click on this link in your own time, you will see the projects that are very important projects for the International Accounting Standards Board at the moment. So these projects are, um, for example, we've got um, accounting policies, accounting estimates, insurance contracts, that was the one that I mentioned right at the start. We've got business combinations, which is consolidation. We've got classification of liabilities. We've also got deferred tax, disclosure for accounting policies. We've got dynamic risk management. My old friend that I was talking about right at the start, extractive industries, and there's also one there on de-recognition of financial liabilities. Now, this is only half of the research activities that are currently being looked at by the International Accounting Standards Board. So the reason why I mention these is that all of these areas are currently important topics for standard setting. So because they're important topics, it means that there is some important research that needs to be done on these accounting standards. So some of them, just to so you can understand what the abbreviation means, some of them are what we call MP, that means maintenance projects. Some of them are SPs, which is standard setting projects. Some of them are OPs, which is operating projects. And some of them are RPs, which is research projects. So that gives you a bit of an idea about what type of project they're working on and they're looking at. Now, again, all of these are current dates. You can see June 2020, uh, 2021, quarter three, 2020, etc. So that means that, for example, if it's an exposure draft, um, there will be information to examine regarding the exposure draft when you have different people commenting. There'll be information to look at in the next um, few months. Um, some of them will be, as I said, maintenance projects where they're looking at potentially fixing up some of the words in the accounting standard or whatever. Um, where there is a revised accounting standard, I particularly find those ones very interesting because you can always do what we call a pre and post, pre and post investigation. And I think that's always quite exciting. Okay, now another interesting thing that you should consider doing for any research idea, and this is something you may have heard of, it's called the research pitch. So Robert Pfaff is a very famous finance professor at University of Queensland, Australia, and he has developed this simple template for pitching research. Now, I've provided the reference here, and you can have a look at that in your own time. But why this is such a cool tool, if you like, is because it enables you to start thinking about very important 
questions related to your research. And if you can complete the research pitch, it's a very good start to obviously your project. And also if you're applying for research funding as well, which is really important. So we get all our honours students and also our PhD doctoral students and our master's students to do a research pitch. So in the research pitch, it's very simple. It's two pages. So the first page, you need to come up with your title of your research. So there's some research that I'm working on at the moment with some academics at my work, and it's on the auditing concept professional scepticism. So next thing you need for your pitch is a research question. So for those of you starting a new project, you need to think about what your question is that you want to investigate. The next thing you need to do is identify some key papers in the area that you can draw on. So this particular idea is on professional scepticism in education. So we've found some key papers in the area of auditors' professional scepticism also, because we're looking at accounting skills, we've found a paper on professional skills required of accountants. And also, we've found a paper on forensic accounting courses on scepticism. So, key paper is where you identify the research that has probably got you thinking about this project that you're working on. The next important thing is the motivation. So it's very important, and I've been talking about this a lot tonight, that your research has appropriate motivation. So what is the area that you're contributing to? And I gave you many examples tonight in terms of accounting standards, in terms of disclosure in a particular country setting, also in terms of an industry that you might want to have a look at. So in this particular research pitch, we're looking at professional scepticism and we're doing that because it is a very important concept. And there is regulation, and the regulation is IAESB 2017. So there's the regulation. And we think it's important, obviously, for standard setters and employers. There is little research in the area. And that's something else I've been talking about tonight, a lot about is the lack of research in a particular area. So that's always good motivation for doing a study. Another important part of the pitch is the general basic idea. So what is the idea of your research project? So the idea for this one is to look at the effectiveness of accounting information on accounting education in developing scepticism. So if you think back to the earlier papers we looked at tonight, I obviously had um, other ideas in terms of applying an Olson model to target firms uh, or applying an Olson model to a financial instrument disclosure index. That's the general idea. You then need to look at your data Briefly tell us what the data is. What's the data? So are you using Australian companies, US companies, European companies, Egyptian companies? What are you actually using for your data? Um, or 
Is it survey data or is it interview data? So you need to talk about your data and then your tools. So um, what tools are you using? Are you using um, Starter? Are you using SPSS? Are you using, um, in my notes here, I use a tool called Lexi Mansa or NVivo. So there's lots of different things you could have under tools. And then it's very important to also talk about what is new in your research. So summarise what's new about your project. So is it the fact that you're investigating a new country that has not been looked at before? Is it because you're looking at a new standard that has just been implemented? Is it because there are issues from the IASB with an accounting standard and you need to test the effectiveness of that standard in the past 10 years? Okay, so what is new? Also something I haven't really talked much about today are theories. So there could be something new in your application of a specific theory to your research. So you might be using a theory, one of the theories we talk about with value relevance research is the fineness theorem. So that might be what's new about this study is applying the fineness theorem to your research. And then finally, we need to know, answer the question, well, so what, you know? How is this research going to be useful? Why do people want to know about your research? So it could be that you're giving information to standard setters, regulators, investors. In this case, we're giving information to educators, professional accounting bodies. So, so what? And then finally, you need to think about the contribution. So what is the contribution of your research? What are the research implications? So we are contributing to the accounting research literature in the area of accounting education and professional scepticism. And there has been limited studies in that area and Hopefully, we would contribute to redesigning the accounting curriculum. And then we've also got a section for other considerations. So this is where you start thinking about, do you need ethics? So is it a survey? Is it an interview? Do you need ethics clearance? Um, do you have access to the data? Some universities don't have access to the data. So is that going to be a challenge for you? Sample, is there enough sample to run your tests? Um, so these are just some of the things that you can talk about with other considerations. So I hope you found the research pitch to be useful. I find it very useful. And as I said, there is a template which you can actually, um, I think you can download it, but if you go to the actual paper, the FAF paper, you'll see some really good examples. And in his paper, he talks about examples from finance literature, from accounting, and also other disciplines. Because I think we've got some economists on tonight some management people, marketing. This pitch now has gone quite broad. So you'll get lots of really useful examples and I think it's a really good thing to do. So in terms of publishing um, papers and um, as I said, I've had quite a bit of experience now on different journals. Um, so, well... 
if you're working independently, that's one thing. And obviously, working independently is fantastic because you know yourself and how you operate. And when you work independently, you're in charge of the data, you're in charge of the writing. So, um, you know, it's it's obviously a lot of responsibility for you yourself, but you have total 100% faith in your paper, in your research, because you're responsible for it yourself. Um, if you work in teams, I currently do work in, in a lot of teams, and I find working in teams is very, very helpful for me um, because um, I work with diverse teams. So I work with teams that work at different universities, teams with students and so on, and every team brings something different. So very important to obviously think about your team of researchers and the contribution they all bring. Now, this is important because some research teams are probably doubling up a bit on some people in the team who are very good at data collection or something, or someone who's really good at writing, formulating ideas. Um, so I, I try and pick a team where everyone has a role to play, an important role in the paper, um, and it seems to work quite well. So I've got some people who love playing with data. I've got people who are very good at modelling. I've got people who are very good at ideas. So all of these people are very good on my team. Um, I mentioned the research pitch. So if I was starting a project, I would make sure that I've thought about all of those important questions that I just talked about with the research pitch. So um, make sure that you do understand um, those different parts of your research project. Make sure you've done your homework before you start the project. And that's why we make sure we get our students to do the pitch so they know that they are sure about their project before they start. There's nothing worse than being involved in a project or supervising a student. You get halfway into the candidature or the project and you realise the data is not available. Or you, or you struggle with the theory you're going to use. Okay, so it's really good to have thought through these issues before you get started. Um, presenting at seminars, I think, is the best practice ever. And I, over the years, I've done a lot of presentations and I find them incredible for feedback. Also really good because before you present a paper, you do look at it very, very closely and you do also look at your slides very closely. And often presenting helps you identify some additional issues there might be or some further questions that you have about the paper before sending it off. So I would never ever send a paper to a journal without a presentation of some form. Now, the presentation might be very small. It might be with um, local people at work. It might be with the accountants, the financial accountants or whatever. It also might be a seminar at your university. It might also be a seminar at a conference, conference presentation etc. But you definitely need to present your work. Getting colleagues to give you feedback. So even, um, you know, someone who is not exactly in your area, it's always nice to show them your paper, get them to read it. Uh, they can often identify if the story is making sense. And also to do with that is making sure that it reads well. So um, if you have access to professional proofreading services, very important, uh, can be very important 
for um, international journals as well, just to tighten up um, a lot of the language, um, punctuation, grammar, those types of things. So these are the list of references that I have referred to and some additional ones tonight, today. So um, if you want any of those copies of those papers and you can't get them from your library, your university, I would be very happy for you to send me an email. Um, I am on LinkedIn. So for those of you, you might have seen the um, adverse advertisement for tonight, for today on LinkedIn. So you can um, contact me through LinkedIn. I think there's also the Facebook page. You can contact me through there as well. Now, the last thing I wanted to do was tell you about something very exciting that you might want to join, and that is the conference that I'm the president of, which is the AFANS Conference, the Accounting and Finance Association Conference of Australia and New Zealand. And this will be held online on the 5th to the 7th of July. Um, it is free to members of AFANS. It's a very minimal membership fee. So um, if you are interested, um, very happy to talk to you about that. The website is up there so you can find out more information about that. At this conference, we have already got 207 paper presentations um, and we've also got keynote speakers. Amongst them is the IASB board member, Antarka. She will be talking to us. And we also have a finance professor as well. So um, that's just something you might be interested in. Okay, that's the end of my slides. I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Prof. Jack, uh, for your contribution and uh, effort. Right now, uh, Prof. Jack will answer your questions. If uh, anyone, anyone wants to, anyone wants to, to ask uh, questions, uh, you can open the mic and uh, tell the questions uh, after and then after uh, close the mic. Hello, Hello um, everyone. Um, just I'm wondering if you can hear me. Yes. Hi, Jack. How are you going? Good, thank you. Uh, this is Hashim. Um, uh, I was your student in the doctoral symposium in 2018. Oh! <laughs> in, in, uh, in Welcome. All oh, right. Okay. Lovely. Very nice. Lovely, lovely to see you. Um, nice to see you. Thank you for this. Uh, Thank you for this fruitful presentation. Um, I do have one question for you. Um, as an editor of one of the top journals in accounting, do you agree with the statement that um, most of editors in these top uh, journals um, inclined to reject papers that are coming from developing countries and developing context? And uh, as you know, uh, most of my colleagues um, they are like concerned about this issue. They are like saying that most of papers are inclined to publish some um, data from developed countries. So, so our um, our chances in getting our public uh, papers pu published is uh, minimal uh, in comparison to those who are working in developed countries. Thank you for that question. That's a very, very important question. Now, um, the philosophy that I believe in and the one that it appears to be at the journals that I have been working at is that if the paper is quality, it will get published. <laughs> so the other thing is, is that research on developing countries is becoming 
Well, it has been for many years now, but it's very, very important for us to learn about these countries and learn about the accounting systems or the economic systems, finance practices, et cetera, education systems that are currently happening in the developing countries. So my experience has not been your, what your experience is. The other experience I'd like to share with you is when I was working on the International Accounting Education Standards Board, we had many, many representatives from developing countries. They were a very important part of the International Education Standards Board. So, um, and the reason, well, I mean, everyone was represented on that board because obviously everyone's, built, everyone's input, everyone's um, opinion is very, very important to decision-making purposes. So I also agree with that with research. So I have never, in my time with all the journals, I have never rejected a paper because it was from a country outside Australia or anything like that. The only time I reject papers is if the quality is not there. So that's the way I see it and that's the way I see the philosophy has been, the vision has been, the strategy at the journals I've been involved with. There's never been anything ever said about rejection of those papers, no. Um, so it all comes down to me for quality. And, um, and as I said, I think there's some really, really interesting research questions that are waiting to be answered in developing countries. So obviously one of them, which I didn't get time to talk about tonight, is sustainability. So sustainability initiatives. The other one is information communication technology. So I have already done a small paper on developing countries and the adoption of ICT, information communications technology. So I see, I see many, many, many research opportunities. I should also say that I have in the past examined doctoral theses from developing countries. So I have also examined theses, and these have been highly satisfactory. Does that yeah, answer your awesome. question? Uh, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, I just have one point to, uh, if you allow me to add, um, regarding the research pitch. Um, uh, you know, uh, Robert Pfaff, uh, has the, his own templates, but I think also Sumit Ludia, Professor he Sumit does. has, he does has another one. And uh, I think uh, the one with, uh, the one for Dr. Sumit uh, is focusing more in qualitative uh, methods, isn't it? Correct, correct. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I should have put that up as a um, other reference, but that one is very good too. What I will do is revise and add that reference in as well. Thank you, that's a very good point. Uh, thank you so much, Jack. Pleasure, nice to see you again. Uh, lovely to see you. Um, hello, Jack. Uh, thank you for your uh, very interesting uh, workshop. And uh, I really uh, benefit from them. Uh, I have a question, uh, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, I'm asking about uh, how to improve uh, the paper to be published uh, from uh, journal ranking uh, four to three to two to one. Uh, what uh, are the, the main criteria just to improve the paper from uh, top ranked journal to be, rank, to be published in uh, top ranked journals? Okay, so the, the, the top ranking, um, the top top, so if you're talking about the super, we call them super A stars, like the accounting review, um, review of accounting studies, temporary accounting research, journal of accounting and economics, 
etc. Um, they are the top top journals. So um, I think the main difference between a paper at a level and your level is a bit different to mine than I know. So I'm just thinking the top journal level one or whatever compared to maybe a lower three or four whatever. I think the main main thing is uniqueness. So um, obviously something which is very different um, that has not been explored yet in the literature. So the top, top journals are not looking at replication studies. So they're not looking at something, a model that was tested five years ago that we're now testing now. I mean, that won't usually get published in the top, top journal. It has to be a very unique contribution. And the other important thing is theory. So the top accounting journals have very good underpinning theory, theoretical contribution. So um, that's really, really important. You do not find many of those journal papers without good theory. Now, um, in terms of those top journals, I don't think it's necessary because we know that the top journals are largely US. I don't think it's necessary to have US data. And I know this from personal experience. So US data does not always need to be used. But you need to obviously tell us or tell the editors why your country data is important and how it makes a contribution to the body of research. So you need to fill a gap. You need to be unique in filling a gap. You need to make a contribution. You need good theory. And I think the other thing which makes a really, really amazing paper is the ability to test your model in every way possible. So you don't just do it, for example, at share price 90 days. You do it at all these different time periods. You, um, you look at breakdowns in samples. You look at lots of different proxies or variables. You look at every imaginable scenario that you can imagine for your model to double test it. Because what will happen is you'll get reviewers and often you'll get three reviewers plus an editor who will come up with lots and lots and lots of suggestions. Now, I've been through this process recently and we've had a paper for about nearly four years and lots and lots and lots of changes and changes and changes. So practically it's a new paper. And I think that's the other thing. You have to be ready to do everything that the editor reviewer tells you to do. So if they suggest that you go and do another sample in the US, well, you might need to do that. Now, sometimes you can't do everything because it's beyond the scope. So that's okay. You just need to explain to the editors why you can't do that. The other thing that's really important is that you will have a long, long, long reply to the reviewers and the editor. Sometimes the replies are longer than the paper. And that's just because often you have to do lots of extra, extra things. So this is what a top journal paper is. It means a lot of work, probably many changes, and it might even change the direction of the paper, which you might not be too happy about, but if you want to get it published, that's what you have to do. Hopefully that's useful. Yes. Thank you. Hello. 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 Yeah, I have uh, one question. You heard me? Yes. Do you hear me, Prof? 
Yes, I can. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your, your ultimate presentation. Actually, my question, uh, all, the, all the time, when I send my paper to the top journal, uh, I got this answer sometimes. They said, your, your data is not enough for our audience because it is related to single country. So what's your opinion about this? So again, it comes back to what your question is re regarding that single country. So, you know, single country studies can get published, but they need to make a contribution and it's, it can't just be the single country, right? So, you know, if you're looking at a, a study that was done in the US and now you want to do it in your country, well, that won't be enough of a contribution. So you really need to have a look at what your question is, and that has to be the part that's really, really unique contribution that, that is different to the other papers. So as I said, you can get papers published um, in single countries, but it, it's to do with what you're trying to do and the method that you're executing. So, you know, maybe it's something to do with your model that needs to be a bit more special. Um, maybe if your data isn't, isn't enough, you need to get more data from a longer time series. Or maybe you need to compare your results to another country. So they're the things that I would do if I got that answer. So number one, I would look back at what my research question is and what I am doing, which is different to any other studies. So if I am doing something different, but they still say my data is not enough, well, I'd try and get more data. Or if they, they, they say that your country, you need more, I would do a comparison with another country. Okay, so like I said, high quality papers um, of any country should be getting published if the idea is unique enough, is individual enough. That, that's what I think. So that's, that's what I think when I see papers. But if they continually say that, well, then it comes back to, I think, what your contribution is and whether you need some additional data, maybe from another country, or you expand out the time period. Hopefully Hello. that helps. Hello, Jay. Thank you. Hello, Jack. I have just a question. Hello? Hello. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, your presentation and for your time offered for us. There's a, say a journal with the scopes. We have problem with the scopes now. Some uh, journal that publish it, uh, or they have got, uh, you know, permission for the scopes since 2002, 2005, whatever. Now, 2019 and 2020, there is uh, no more uh, in the scopes list. And we have done the research with that journal. So my question is, why they stop uh, for, uh, you know, listing in the scopes that journal? And uh, so I talk about general, there's not any specific uh, journal. And then we, our research, we publish it. They still at uh, the scopes uh, uh, manner or just when the journal disappeared, there's no any more uh, our research listed in the scopes. Do you understand um, what they Sorry, I don't understand what you meant. Did you say scope? What was the word you used? Scopes, scopes, Jordan, scopes. Hello? Scopes. Scopes. Yeah. As in C S C O P E. Scopes. Scopes. Okay. Scopes. Scopes, yeah. Scopes. Scopes? Yes. Scopus. Okay. Scopus. Yes. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I don't know. Can you give me an example of a journal? There's some journal. There was in Scopus, and now it's not there uh, anymore. I don't know why. And the second, if we are publishing that journal, 
and there's a there's not any more in the list in the scopes research so will be accepted as our uh, working or our research at the, uh, at the level of scopes or not I can so, I, so my answer to this question is and we, we are going through something a bit similar at the moment because our main list is called the ABDC list um, but there are many different rankings of journals and many different indices which show the journals and so on. And they're all, all very, very different. So um, some of the journals that we used to call high quality A star journals are now A journals or B journals. Some of them have gone off the list, which sounds like it's what's happened to you with the Scopus list. Okay. Um, so all I can say that we do, what we do, is that we consider many different indices. So we don't just look at one. So I would always provide evidence from different ones. So I provide evidence from the European Journal list, from the Australian list, from, um, from our library list, whatever it is, and that will give me different rankings of a journal. So on some lists, the journal might not be there. On other ones, it will be there. So I think you need to provide evidence of where it was in the past. It was on Scopus. And uh, if it's now not on Scopus, then you need to show um, evidence of a list where it is actually on. Um, and the other thing is with these lists, they change all the time. So... Every three, four years, there's a new update. And in that time, a journal ranking will go up, it will go down, it will stay the same. And it's very, very important to lobby for your journal. So if your journal's now not on the list, and I've seen this happen with some journals in Australia, well, then... The people who are responsible for the journal, the editors, but also the um, authors, need to lobby very hard to get that journal back on the list, okay? And they need to really work out if there's an issue, they need to fix it, and they just need to make sure that lots of people want to get that journal back on the list. Because it's really important to have a journal on list because when you're going for jobs, where you go for promotion your teaching, research, whatever your situation is, they do look at those rankings. So um, I don't know if I've answered entirely properly here because I don't use Scopus, but um, that's what happens when our journals go off the list. We need to find other indexes which actually have the journal or show evidence and we need to work on getting it back on the list in the future. Dear Professor? Yes. Could you hear me? I can. Yes, Ahmed with you. Thank you very much for this useful lecture. I really had a great knowledge from it. Dear Professor, the first paper, you talk about value, value relevance and disclosure. Uh, it's the same topic of my PhD. I finished my PhD since uh, two uh, months, and I want to have a joint uh, paper with you, if you don't mind about the effect of corporate risk disclosure on firm value? Can we? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like a proposal. Um, so I, I suggest if you contact me via LinkedIn um, and, and we, can talk, we can talk offline. Okay, I, want, uh, I, I need the email or LinkedIn. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. If, if contact me then, and if I I can't, I can I can put you in contact with people if I can't help. Contact me through LinkedIn. Okay. Or Facebook. Yeah. Hello, Jack. I'm glad I'm glad we've got the same research. That's nice. Yes. Hello. Hello, Jack. Hello, bro. Uh, I'm I'm Hakim Brasman. I'm a professor from the American University of Malta. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah. If I may elaborate on the issue of publishing in top uh, journals while the research is uh, on developing or emerging countries, I I, I really uh, believe that it's a it's a challenging 
uh, issue. It's not easy. Uh, based on my experience uh, over the past 20 years, I've been working especially on emerging countries and MENA countries. And uh, uh, as for the American journals, uh, except two journals, all the other journals like, you know, JAR or top five journals, usually they are not interested even in European data. Very, we, we do find very few papers that are using German or French or European data that get published in, uh, in top five, uh, let's say, American journals. Very few. Because yeah. these journals usually they require American, US data. Uh, there are only two journals, like the International Journal of Accounting or Journal of International Accounting and Taxation. They are yeah. more open yeah. to international data. And I would suggest for the early career researchers that they can, it's much better to use cross country studies rather than uh, uh, conduct study on only one country. Because when we conduct or uh, cover a whole area like MENA region, like uh, South, uh, South, South Asian region, we get better chance to, to get published in these two uh, journals. Because we have, we, there are not too, very few journals that can accept uh, research from, from emerging countries. Uh, it's it's it re, uh, it's it's a very big issue, yeah very big challenge to 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 have the paper published in three star journals. As for the two star journals, we can find other journals in UK or in Australia. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm talking about EBS, EBS ranking, but the ranking is quite yeah. similar to the ABDC. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah uh, it's it's not very, it's not easy. It's not it's very difficult. It's very it takes. So I I remember that uh, I got a paper which. Third round review, huh? and then we go through the re rejection. So imagine after you work for three years, huh? you get the rejection of the third round, round review from the three star journals. It's it's quite disappointing, but uh, uh, we have to we have yeah we have to continue working on these issues. Yeah, sometimes sometimes uh, maybe if we mix developing countries with developing countries, develop yeah. and develop, we get better chance to. That's to good get too. To the paper that, yeah. What do you think good. about this? Yeah, no, no, no. Look, totally. Um, look, I mean, I agree. I mean, when, what I said before was, you know, it is difficult to get published in those top, top ones. Um, but, you know, you can do it, but it, it is difficult. Um, but you're right. There, I mean, there's some very good US journals like International Journal of Accounting and the audit one as well, where they do look at other country data, I know that, and they do like the multi-country setting or they like countries that are different with different legal systems and things like that. But that that's always quite popular. So, you know, you, you often have success with that. But, you know, my um, advice with the um, paper where you, you uh, missed out on the third round, and I had that happen to me once at a paper with a car. I think it was the After fourth the round. round. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fourth round, I think, for me. Um, and it was it was quite, you know, upsetting. But at the same time, it made me think um, that, you know, for my research plan is now where I have a number of papers on the go and I target a range of different journals. So some papers I know, I'm very realistic, some papers I know will not go to the top journal. Some papers I know maybe have a chance. Some I know are more practitioner, they're more high impact papers. So I think it's important to make sure, and I should have added it when I talked about some, the tips before, you really need to have your journal in mind when you are writing your paper because, yep. you know, it's no good just saying, yeah, it's going to the top, it's going to the top, it's going to the top. Um, it probably won't get to the top it's right from the start because you've got the wrong sample or you've got no theory, or you're using the wrong model, you know, it's going to happen. So you really need to have that conversation with yourself and your co-authors, your team, where the paper is going, and always have a second choice. So if it doesn't go to the first one, it'll go to the second one. Yeah. And then I think as a community of scholars, we all have a role in playing in making sure other journals outside the top five, whatever, are seen as being very important high-impact journals. 
So there's a lot of journals out there that are incredibly good. They reach out to many, many different authors and, and yeah, that's um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but we need to educate people about how good these journals are. So, you know, I've seen some amazing work come that has been published in journals that where I've worked. That's very, very high quality. So um, I think we need to promote a lot of these other journals and those rankings as well. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank okay, you. Prof. Uh, one more question, just as you. One more ahead. question. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Uh, actually, actually, Prof. Uh, the problem that we face here that there is no data available available for us here. So. Uh, if I got data for a single country, is okay. But if I, I want to get data from other country, uh, we face a problem to get this data. Data. Uh, in this occasion, uh, I would be happy if you suggest, uh, based on your experience, there is any uh, free data, a free website, offer data for us. It's going to help us to write an article in future. That's all done. Thank you so much. Okay, so, you know, I think, that, look, this problem is something that um, Australian universities are now encountering because um, at the moment um, we've, we've lost, um, quite, you know, there's resources that we've lost with the COVID-19 and we are struggling with um, financially in terms of um, with some of our databases. So, this is going to become a big issue, I think, um, for um, many universities and many academics. So, um, so there's a couple of couple of things. I mean, like one thing which um, happens quite a lot in Australia, because there are many universities before COVID nineteen that did not have financial resources for databases. So. Um, so these universities often um, do work with other universities where they have access to data. So um, I, I think that's always something to keep in mind is that, um, you know, if you're in a country and you've got um, some access to your own data but you need data from another country, well, then often it might be good to um, establish a um, collaboration, a research collaboration with um, another co-author. And, um, and I know that, you know, there's been some talk of that tonight here. So, so maybe that's something to share, share what you have. Um, but I'm a firm believer in data collection and um, hand collect. So when times are not good when there's no data, no databases that we can access. Um, well, that's where you create your own database. So um, I've had some PhD students collecting all the data from Chinese annual reports, for example, um, all hand collect. So um, they've got all the data from the listed companies and the variables they're looking at. So it's hand collect. So you can always hand collect. Now, it's obviously a big job, but if you've got several um, students that can work for you to help you collect data, I think that's a good thing. Um, the other thing is, is that obviously not all research is going to be quantitative research. So um, you've also got obviously um, access to interviews and things like that. So you know, some of the research I do is through interviews with um, professional bodies, uh, with accountants, and um, obviously I don't need, um, you know, I don't need a database to do that type of research. Um, so, yeah, so I, I suppose my advice is to maybe find someone to collaborate with at an institution where they do have some data or combine your own individual data from your country that you've hand collected with another person. So you can build, maybe build. And, you know, maybe that's something going forward is that 
you have got people in different countries building a whole database from their own hand collected data so I mean, you know, that that's what I think. And, and I do see examples of that happening at my university at the moment. Okay, thank you so much, your idea. I got your idea, thank you, Prof. Uh, Pleasure. I'd like, I'd like to thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, and the... Uh, Thank you. Inshallah, we, we will meet in the conference, inshallah. We will meet in the conference, in this coming conference online. Oh, good. Oh, at the IFANS conference. I hope to see Assalamu some of you at IFANS. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Jack. Hello? 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 Uh, this is Professor Jack. Uh, I think that uh, you have uh, done very well uh, with uh, answering a lot of questions uh, there, Jack. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so all that uh, remains for me to say is thank you, uh, everyone thank you. that uh, joined us. And I think I thank you very much uh, for taking the time out uh, to present uh, to us today, Jack. Uh, it be uh, it is uh, being appreciated. Uh, finally, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Prof. Jack Perret and all my colleagues. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm really happy. And if you want me to come back again at some stage, I would be very happy to present again. We hope that you will visit Egypt soon. Ah, that would be great. I haven't been to Egypt. I would love to come one day. You are welcome. You are welcome to this, bro. Okay. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Thanks, bro. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye from Australia. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye. 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 Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.